Hello, this is Julia Heine from the Center for Macroecology, Evolution and Climate. Um, together with Carsten Rabeck and Michael Beauregard, we wrote a paper for ecography that took part in the E4 competition, and I'm now going to read it to you. Um, please note that the references and figures can be found in the paper version of the article. Conservation of species interactions to achieve self-sustaining ecosystems. A desirable goal of nature management is to re-establish self-sustaining ecosystems that ensure the persistence of natural habitats and species without requiring active management. Such self-sustainability relies on functional species interactions. Yet, species interactions are often overlooked in the conservation literature and when designing species-specific management efforts. Some interactions may not be restored under general management, such as land protection, and may require additional specific management interventions. Interventions targeting these specific interactions fall in a gap between general and species-specific management, effect effectively bridging community and population level approaches to conservation management. We propose that managers should explicitly identify cases where active management of specific interaction partners is required to achieve population self-sustainability. In addition, they should ensure that general management interventions do not inadvertently conflict with natural occur naturally occurring interactions, potentially thwarting conservation targets. Interaction functionality may be restored by relying on native species and by identifying the spatial context in which interactions are most likely to re-establish, considering distributional range overlap of interaction partners, local variation in the individual encounter rate, or even spatial variation in the expected success rate, efficiency, of the focal interaction. Conservation efforts do not always restore interactions between species. Species-focused conservation efforts tend to focus on maintaining viable populations of focal species. Employing species-specific management tools such as captive breeding, stocking and supplementary feeding. Yet, despite considerable, considerable economic investment in active management, many species-focused conservation projects fail to result in self-sustaining populations. We argue here that viable long-term persistence of populations frequently depends on particular species-specific interactions, and that actively considering these in management may be vital to achieving conservation targets. Interactions required for population persistence may include not only mutualistic interactions, such as pollination and seed dispersal, but also common soil predator and parasitic interactions as these can be essential for, uh, for species survival and reproduction. Top predators, for example, can play a crucial role in conservation due to their top-down regulation in ecosystems, and consequently their global decline may result in extinction cascades and trophic downgrading. It is often an implicit assumption of management that a functional interaction network of species will be restored once species abundance, abundances reach a certain level. Empirically, however, this has not always been the case, as disturbances may alter behavior that controls interactions. For example, native seed dispersers may prefer to eat invasive fruits over native fruits, weakening the interaction between seed disperser and native fruit. Some vulnerable species rely on interaction partners that may themselves be threatened or play key roles for other species and these roles must be sustained to ensure ecosystem integrity. If functional interaction networks are not restored as part of conservation efforts, we risk deterioration of general ecosystem function and co-extinctions, possibly cascading through the ecosystem. In spite of the potential importance of interactions for successful management, only a relatively small proportion of conservation-oriented studies have explicitly considered interactions. A search for the topic conservation and the topic conservation and interaction in the Web of Science core collection, categories ecology and biodiversity conservation, reveals that up to 1990, 
no conservation-focused papers explicitly mention species interactions. Since 1990, the number of papers with the topic conservation has been growing slowly, though papers mentioning interactions still comprise a small part of this literature. We will refer here specifically to interactions between particular species that are obligate for at least one of them. These are not the only interactions of relevance for species conservation, but we focus on these as they are essential for reaching the goal of self-sustaining populations. They also have received relatively little attention in conservation literature. This is distinct from the broader community interaction framework focusing on ecosystem function, food webs and nutrient structure, nutrient structure that is deservedly receiving increasing attention in conservation science. While that approach may incorporate particular species, such as ecosystem engineers like beavers that affect river flow, or large herbivores that maintain open landscapes and transport nutrients, its focus is explicitly on function of the whole ecosystem rather than on individual species-species interactions. This ecosystem-level approach is essential in itself and should not be ignored, but there are vulnerable species interaction for which this approach is not sufficient to prevent extinction because they require specific additional management efforts. Therefore, we concern ourselves specifically with named species-specific interactions as a means to prevent extinction and to re-establish self-sustaining populations of multiple interacting species. We aim to bridge the gap between community and population level approaches to conservation. Additionally, we introduce a framework to integrate the targeted conservation of vulnerable obligatory species interactions within the current general management practices. Ideally, management should, should aim towards populations and communities that are self-sustaining and functional in the absence of continued intervention effort. Continued active management takes time, is labor-intensive and more problematically depends on the continuation of limited and often unreliable funding. Though the initial cost may be greater, we believe that management that aims to create self-sustaining communities is likely to be more cost-effective in the long run. Self-sustaining communities are also more likely to be resilient to perturbations from anthropogenic disturbances, such as land use changes in, uh, and climate change. Furthermore, ecosystem services such as pollination of crops provided by self-sustaining, resilient communities can be more reliable. Integrating interaction-focused management in current practice. There are two key elements to interaction-focused management. One, avoiding management interventions that weaken naturally occurring interactions and two, supporting the re-establishment of successful interactions among naturally occurring species. The first is largely a question of implementing efficient management policy, whereas the second requires that managers take a broader multi-species view when designing species-specific conservation programs. Management that inadvertently weakens naturally occurring interactions is common when flagship species are the focus of targeted population restoration. An example of this is the nominally highly successful restoration program of the pink pigeons, Nesunas Mary, on Mauritius. By means of an intensive captive breeding program, management has increased pigeon abundance from fewer than 20 remaining individuals in the mid-1970s to approximately 470 in 2019. This effort has led the IUCN threat level for this species to be adjusted from critically endangered in 1996 to vulnerable in 2018. However, several decades after release of the birds in the forest, they remain dependent on supplementary feeders, and thus the population is unlikely to become self-sustaining and to persist in the absence of continued management. Additionally, the pink pigeon has historically play played an ecological role in the environment as fruit-eating, occasional seed disperser of native plants, many of which are presently endangered themselves. Even though the population of pink pigeons is relatively large today, their continued dependence on supplementary feeding has resulted in limited activity of most individuals, 
which stay in the close vicinity of feeding stations and are rarely observed foraging on natively occurring fruits. As a result, the pigeons may not overlap with all plants that were historically in their diet, and the fragmentation of forests limits dispersal. This means that they do not fulfill their ecological role as seed dispersers, and thus their associated plants continue to rely on active management themselves, such as, via, such as reproduction via plant nurseries. From a species-specific perspective, the, the pink pigeon is doing well, but the population is neither self-sustaining nor contributing to self-sustainability of the community. Whereas this example is fairly clear, management may also block naturally occurring interactions in more subtle ways. For example, a common management intervention in Danish national parks is to establish hives of honeybee, Apis mellifera, for honey production, commonly claimed to have the added benefit of ensuring efficient pollination of native plants. However, honeybees may decrease the abundance of native threatened pollinators via competition for floral resources. If interactions are specialized, such, such that native insects are more efficient pollinators of native plants, the presence of honeybees may weaken naturally occurring interactions, with negative effects on the community and ultimately the long-term management goals that were the original rationale for establishing the national parks. In practice, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that all interventions may, may have some negative effect on the community. For example, there is little probability that a pink pigeon would re-establish viable populations without a period of captive breeding and supplementary feeding, but this degraded the ecological role that the bird played in seed dispersal. The resolution to this conflict could be to ensure that supplemental feeding employs native fruits and ensure that access to feeder fruits trigger the natural feeding behaviour of the pigeons, as well as replanting native fruit trees close to captive release sites, with the long-term goal of gradually reducing supplemental feeding to zero. However, captive species may still lose any cultural conventions involved in selection of food and habitat. Similarly, bee introductions into natural areas might employ native bee species to maintain local interactions. The long-term demographic effects of interventions such as planting native fruit trees can be hard to predict. For example, a higher density of fruit trees may attract competitors of the pigeons to the site and otherwise change the local species composition of the area. While this makes such specific manipulations potentially problematic, a specific focus on restoring native species could be considered a, straight, a safe strategy. However, continual monitoring and adaptive management of target populations is essential to ensure that interventions actually work towards conservation goals. Restoring interaction functionality. Functional interactions may be defined as interactions that positively impact the survival or reproduction of at least one of the interaction partners often enough to affect population dynamics. Such interactions include pollination and seed dispersal that increase reproductive success, assist with colonization of new areas, enable source sink dynamics and rescue effects between populations, and amplify genetic variation. As well as, for example, trophic interactions between predators and prey, and common soil associations, such as when certain tree species act as nest sites for animals. For example, holes in trees for hornbills, Buceroteidae, both necessary for their population persistence. It may even be important to maintain interactions that have a negative impact on one of the interaction partners. For example, predator-prey, parasitic host. Apart from the intrinsic value of predatory or parasitic species and the need for taxonomically unbiased conservation, they provide different ecosystem functions such as trophic regulation, shape host population dynamics, and influence energy flow within ecosystems. For example, the predator-prey interactions between the European rabbit, Oryctolagus cuniculus, and its predators, the Iberian lynx, Lynx pardinus, and the Spanish imperial eagle, Aquila adalberti, demonstrate the importance of interactions that are negative for one species, but essential for population persistence of the others. 
Both predators are highly dependent on rabbits, which make up about 88% of their diets. A decline in rabbit population, such as during the outbreak of rabbit hemorrhagic disease, RHD, in the Iberian Peninsula during the late 1980s, can endanger its interaction with predators, affect their population dynamics, and possibly cause further trophic downgrading. Another example of the importance of interactions that are negative for one of the species is the eradication of invasive Rubus alcifolius plants by parasitic blue sawflies, Cyptela jantina, from La Réunion. Despite the extensive literature on biological determinants predicting interaction patterns, literature on the determinants of the functionality of interactions is scarce. The first requirement for inter interactions to take place is a high enough probability that the interaction partners encounter each other. This probability depends on the overlap in occurrence range, range co-occurrence, of the interacting species, the density at which they occur, and the spatial and temporal overlap in their activity patterns at local scales, for example nocturnal versus diurnal or flower phenology. Encounters between species that have the potential to interact do not always lead to successful interactions, even if species abundances are high enough. The likeliness of interaction success when individuals meet depends not only on phenotypic traits that need to match, for example fruits fitting in bill, but also on whether the behavioural during the interaction leads to success, for example not robbing nectar without pollination. Due to the variations in traits and behaviour of species, encounter rates and success rates that are high enough to achieve interaction functionality are specific to each species. The required encounter and success rates may differ under local environmental conditions that can increase, for example, soil nutrients, or decrease interaction functionality, for example, anthropogenic disturbance, invasive species, and can have evolutionary consequences. We argue here that the local efficiency of a given functional interaction is a function of at least three elements. One, range overlap between the interacting species. Two, encounter rates between interacting species in the wild, a function of the abundance and behavior of both species. And three, the success rates of the interactions, for example, pollinator efficiency. The combined probability of these elements determines the strength of the interaction. Each of these elements may be under pressure from anthropogenic threats, and management interventions that target interactions should consider all three. Figure 2.1 demonstrates different types of interactions and highlights obligate interactions, and those with vulnerable species, in red, for which it would be important to check if there are any disturbances in species range overlap encounter rates or success rates of the interaction that reduce its functionality. Figure 2.2 shows the conceptual outcome of an interaction with and without focused conservation effort in relation to the self-sustainability, functionality and possibility of recovery of the interaction. Figure 2.3 provides an empirical example of, this, of its implementation. These concepts will be elaborated on. Interspecific encounters are only possible where there is an overlap in distributional range of the interacting species. Range overlap may deteriorate where there are contrasting anthropogenic pressures on interaction partners. For example, the poaching of lemurs in Madagascar focuses on certain forest fragments, leaving their food plants without interaction partners in lemur-free forests, even though some lemurs persist in nearby forests. Possible conservation measures may involve connecting habitats for, or translocating species. Interspecific encounter rates are primarily a function of the abundance of interacting species and their habitat use and behavior, for example, home range size, nocturnality, territoriality. Anthropogenic disturbances may not only affect local uh, abundances, but also reduce encounter rates by differentially affecting behavior. Light pollution is an example of such a disturbance, as pollinators may be drawn to streetlights instead of flowers at night. Light pollution by streetlights in Italy has impaired both moth anti-predator behavior, causing bats to switch from their usual, usual prey to large moths, 
resulting in an increased cranial size of the bats to accommodate them. Some predators are becoming increasingly nocturnal near humans, influencing their interaction with prey and other species. Another example is diverging changes in phenology of flowers and pollinators, resulting in a phenological mismatch in response to climate change at different rates. These factors can change the encounter rate between species even though they occur in the same habitat. Finally, interaction success rate is the proportion of times at which an interspecific encounter leads to an interaction with a functionally significant outcome. Success depends on matching phenotypic traits and behavior during the interaction that facilitates success. Success rates are naturally affected by factors such as pollinator efficiency and the prevalence of incidental seed predation during seed dispersal, but may also be affected by anthropogenic disturbances. These include the introduction of non-native competitors, such as nectar robbers, or weeds that take up nutrients needed for fruit production. In cases where one interaction partner has been completely lost and populations cannot be restored, one resolution may be to use functional rewilding, the local introduction of a functionally similar species that can maintain interactions that would otherwise be lost. A successful example of the implementation of such functional rewilding is the introduction of Aldabra giant tortoises, Aldabra calis gigantea, on the island Ilozegret in Mauritius. The ebony tree Diospirus egretarum is completely dependent on fruit-eating animals for seed dispersal, historically the domed tortoise Cylindropsis inepta, which is now extinct. The interaction has been su substituted by introducing the Aldabra giant tortoise to the island, and this species now disperses the seed successfully. While in this case a tortoise is vital for ensuring the sustained persistence of the ebony tree, such projects are inherently risky and run the risk of overshadowing other undescribed interactions. Taking spatial and temporal variability in interaction efficiency into account. The interplay between range overlap, abundance, success rates and the combined effects of multiple traits mean that the efficiency of species interactions is variable across the landscape. Anthropogenic disturbances to interactions also vary in intensity across space and may affect the interacting species differentially. For example, introduced ants, Anoplolepis gracilipes, in Mauritius prevent native geckos Felsuma sepidiana, from pollinating endemic Rusea simplex flowers in areas where the plants grow closer to the ground than elsewhere. Similarly, human disturbance such as light and noise pollution may be restricted in open areas such as river banks and be greatly reduced within closed forest. Variations in disturbance across a co the co-occurrence range of interacting species may result in a complex pattern of variation in functionality of interactions. Such variations in interaction efficiency across space may also shift over time, further increasing the complexity of patterns. For example, unusual snowfall in the tropical forest could disrupt seed dispersal. Seed dispersal and seed predation differ between mast fruiting years and years without mast fruiting, and phenological mismatch could increase gradually with progressive climate change. Management planning that does not account for temporal and spatial pattern of interaction efficiency risks failing to achieve conservation targets. An example of management that takes the spatial pattern of interaction efficiency into account is the restoration program for the large blue butterfly, Vangaris arion, which was previously endangered in the UK but has been successfully restored there by reintroduction of a different subspecies. The butterfly's life cycle depends critically on two species. The butterfly lays eggs on a host plant, Themis species, and after hatching, the caterpillars eat the seeds. Later, they drop to the ground and excrete a pheromone that mimics that of the ant, Myrmica sabuleti. The ants take the caterpillars to their nest and feed them until they pupate. After fencing off their habitat failed to prevent extinction of the subspecies in Great Britain and the need for reintroduction with a different subspecies, managers developed a strategy that explicitly focused on areas where interaction efficiency would be expected to be highest. 
by incorporating the plant's requirements of acidic soil with low nutrient content and the ant's microclimate requirements created by using grazers and the groundwater level and selecting areas of relatively little human disturbance, the large blue butterfly species has now increased in abundance and established in the UK. It is important to consider that species interactions may be influenced by factors at larger spatial scales as well, beyond the community dynamics in, this, in one location, for example, forest patch or small island. Species may interact with multiple communities, taking part in a meta-community interaction network and affecting mechanistic processes such as those reflecting source sink dynamics, patch dynamics, species sorting and neutral model frameworks. Functionality of complex multi-species interactions depends on spatial co-occurrence between all the interacting species and species abundances that lead to high enough encounter rates and success rates to achieve self-sustaining sustainability of the communities. Interacting species can have different spatial patterns of occurrence, which exposes them to different environmental conditions. Each community may also be characterized by slightly different environmental conditions that can influence the success rates of interactions. For example, soils conductive to germination, and thereby the co-evolution between interacting species, for example, more seedlings. The combined effect of, all of these differences in range overlap and differences between environments of communities can cause a spatial pattern of slightly different eco-evolutionary adaptations, described as the geographic mosaic the theory of co-evolution. Any conservation efforts that change native species abundance or composition in disturbed communities, such as with the framework we propose, may eventually influence spatial patterns of co-evolution and meta-community dynamics in a different direction than that caused by the anthropogenic disturbance that initially pre uh, precipitated the need for conservation action. An example of anthropogenic disturbance affecting evolution is the decrease in seed size of a palm, Euterpe edulis, in the Brazilian Atlantic forest in areas where large gaped seed dispersers have disappeared changing the match between traits of the interacting species. Management efforts that aim to restore and conserve species interactions should be carefully considered and monitored to prevent negative eco-evolutionary feedbacks caused, for example, by a lack of gene flow between certain areas. Prioritizing obligate interactions for conservation as anthropogenic pressures are increasing and management resources are limited, conservation efforts must be prioritized. Keystone, flagship and umbrella species have, have often been prioritized as a means to protect their constituent communities, but often fail to do so, given that intensive species-focused management generally does not benefit other species and, as discussed above, not always lead to self-sustaining communities. As part of general management efforts, it is important to identify vulnerable species in need of conservation. Within this group, a further prioritization can be added for additional targeted management efforts. Given the importance of interactions, we propose that species that participate in obligate interactions should be prioritized. Interactions can be obligate for one of the species or for both of them, and one species can be involved in several obligate interactions. All obligate interactions may be essential for species survival, which means that further sub-prioritization would need to be done with this in mind and remains unadvisable. We propose the use of functional traits to help identify species with interactions that are obligate without alternatives. For example, the ability to reproduce vegetatively reduces the dependence of plant species on seed dispersers. Trait-based approaches remain a solid foundation for predicting potentially important species interactions, though there are some limitations, such as the high complexity and species diversity in some systems, and limitations in current knowledge of network structure and dependency on interactions. In case of particularly vulnerable interactions, some follow-up while taking this approach is needed. As examples of the use of functional traits to find functionally important species interactions, 
Fleshy fruits may indicate frugivore-mediated seed dispersal, while colorful flowers suggest pollinator-mediated reproduction. Species that are known or suspected to have obligate interactions should be evaluated for threat level in the context of the state of their interaction partners. Even though species engaged in obligate interactions may not be endangered, they may have cryptic vulnerability to extinction if their interaction degrades. These species may be overlooked in standard conservation prioritization. Functional extinction of these interactions, for example caused by behavioral changes following disturbances, can be difficult to identify when interacting species still coexist. Even facultative interactions among particular species may be important enough to highlight a species for prioritization. For example, restoring facultative interactions that benefit endangered species may improve their chance of population recovery. Facultative interactions are found in species with, with alternative strategies, involving compens compensatory morphology or behavior, such as alternative prey, host switching, self-pollination or vegetative reproduction. Plants such as pandana species may reproduce and spread by means of frugivore-mediated seed dispersal, but their seeds also float in the sea and their roots enable vegetative reproduction, leaving them with alternative reproduction strategies when frugivores are absent. Still, frugivore-mediated long-distance dispersal over land might be crucial for the ability of species to track changes in climatic conditions, such as alternative strategies, such alternative strategies can be identified to the best of our abilities by considering the functional traits of species from field observations, literature, or specimens in herbaria or museums. Conclusion. Management plans should include the conservation and restoration of functional species interactions that are essential for species persistence. This will help achieve targets of self-sustainable ecosystems that do not continue to depend on active management and the associated costs, and to prevent cascading extinctions. We need more knowledge on 1. The requirements for interactions to prevent functional extinction. two the different causes of disruption of interactions and three methods to achieve restoration of the self-sustainability of interactions. However, the first goal that needs to be achieved is recognition of the importance of conserving species interactions so that management plans do not prevent the restorations of these interactions and can instead help to increase the number of self-sustaining ecosystems with functional species interactions. Acknowledgements. We would like to thank Anna Martin Gonzalez, Bo Dalsgaard, David Nash, Gerard Ostermeyer, Julian Hume, and Patrick Meyermans for discussion, and the editors and reviewers for constructive feedback. Funding. This project was funded by the Center for Macroecology, Evolution and Climate, Grant DNRF 96. Thank you for listening and please look at the original paper version of this article for the references and figures.